uh, Jean-Marc Perrault, and my uh, topic tonight will be uh, fulfilling childhood dreams thanks to technology. And uh, for some people who are from my generation, you'll probably recognize a few things from uh, our childhood and uh, how it affected us. Now, uh, my life has been a very, very unexpected journey, so I guess I'm an example that you can't stop trying to fulfill some of your dreams, and don't wait until it's too late, until you can't do them anymore. But, you know, midlife crisis there, just for that. <laughs> so as a child, of course, I wasn't that original. I was a geeky kid. I loved science, and I dreamt of being an astronaut. Okay, I didn't get to be an astronaut, but I got as close as I can. Met a whole, I met a whole bunch of astronauts, and even did a, a bit of astronaut training just for fun. So you can, you can virtually become an astronaut without the danger of going to space and having all the fun. Now, when we were kids, there was Equipe Cousteau with uh, Jacques Cousteau, who was the inventor of the breeding regulator. And uh, every show they did, it was something that was never seen before because they pioneered filming under the water. So I was just glued in front of the TV watching that. And I said, oh, I'd like to become a diver. But you know, diving back then was both very expensive and very dangerous. I'm a diver now. I would not dive with that, ever. And uh, even the diving ads were dangerous. <laughs> Times have changed. Huh? Two things you should not do when you're a diver, smoke and drink. <laughs> but you know, those were the publicities for that period. Now, I love space, stars, planets. All kids are interested at some point in space. And uh, yeah, I wanted to become an astronomer, but Back in those days, and I'm talking, you know, early 80s, uh, I mean, the scopes you could buy were very, very expensive. You could not get a decent scope uh, for less than about $1,500 uh, in today's dollars. So not every kid gets that kind of gift under the tree. You usually get a Sears telescope with a an image of the moon that has uh, optical aberrations and such, so that doesn't last very long as a, a hobby when you start out with that. But I got back to astronomy because with technology and products that are made now, instead of doing one at a time, especially the telescope mirrors, they make a whole bunch of them in factories in, uh, in Asia. So the, the chain uh, building of telescopes now in big factories has lowered the cost that you paid the same amount today for a telescope that they paid in 1980. So imagine the difference in adjusted dollars. You had to be rich to be an astronomer. And I dreamt of being a, also a computer programmer. End of the 70s, beginning 80s, computers started to appear, not in homes, unless you were rich, to get that nice piece of computer equipment. But no, I was surprised. My dad got me this, a Texas Instrument computer. And uh, wow, it has 16 Ks of memory. I just shown my students today that the computer they have in my classroom has 250,000 more memory than this. And it had 16 different colors. Okay, hey. But I do believe that we lost something along the way because now compu using computers has become too easy. I mean, we had to record with this the programs on a tape recorder because when you see old movies with computers, you see the tapes turning. And yeah, we used audio tape to record the computer. So if you think uh, you know, the, the sound of a fax machine is annoying, listen to that for 10 minutes <laughs> when you're loading your program. Ah. But got me started and when you wanted a new game you could not go and buy one you only had like two three cartridges for games you had to program it and you had a magazine that explained to you uh, a program and all the different sections of the programs and then you had to type in two three four hundred lines of code without making any mistake anywhere 
Otherwise, the program would not work. But geez, I learned a lot about programming back then with that approach. So today, all they do is you know, they buy the game or they download it. We could change the game parameters. I want more speed. I want more lives. I want, you know, you could do your own cheats. So that, that was kind of interesting. But, you know, I made the, I was a kid, 12 years old. And when they exiled me to the, my grandma's cottage during the summer, no computer, no TV, uh, I brought my uh, computer manuals with me, graphing paper, and I made a program without my computer with me. And I made a rocket, could launch, make noises, stages separate, and the capsule in the space with stars moving, and then a big crash on the surface of the Earth. Came back home, typed all of that in, and you had to draw every pixel, okay, for that program. And I did that on graph paper. I'm not, I'm not a very good, you know, artist, but it was okay. So I start my program, I put David Bowie, Major Tom on the, the darn tape recorder, call my dad to show that to him, and he looks at it and said, oh, that's nice, and he leaves. <laughs> Nothing more came out of that, but if we could time travel, I love Stewie and Brian. <laughs> um, uh, I'd go back there, twist my dad's arm and say, can you buy your kid a floppy drive, at least, you know, just, just a tad more, you know, so we can go further with that. But no, I got my first computer, my own computer, I got it at 25 years old. I mean, I missed the whole deal. 1980s, Bill Gates was starting Microsoft. I could have, <laughs> hey Bill, but no, no, missed that. And that, well, there was a TV show called The Forest Rangers. And I have to say that today's kids' shows are, are kind of, I look at kids' shows with my kids, you know, for years. They're a bit more critical and realistic than the kids' shows we had. I mean, we had Skippy the Kangaroo that did all sorts of stuff, Lassie, and Forest Rangers weren't that realistic kids helping the Forest Rangers. Geez, today everything is about security with the kids. You, you wouldn't let your kids go out in the woods like that, you know. But that stuck in my mind. Then, when it came to choosing a future career, I went to uh, McGill University, studied wildlife management with uh, the late uh, Roger Bider, who was a terrific professor, such a passionate man. And you know what? I studied with him. 1990, 91, and uh, he, he was so much fun because every creature he talked about, he talked without, about it with passion, you know, with love. And he founded the McDonald uh, Echo Museum. It's a little zoo with only animals from Quebec. It's the only place that's like that, so you have to go visit that. Okay, that's a nice little zoo. Get close to the animals. I worked there. I used to go in the cages and play with the fox and have fun. And Dr. Bader told us back then, he said, geez, if the temperature warms up and that uh, permafrost starts to melt, we're in trouble. Well, it's melting. And he knew about it. But he made everything interesting for us. So, got my bachelor's degree, got, on the got out into the world with my CVs, ready to work. And that didn't happen. Because there were no jobs in that domain. Everywhere I went, they said, oh, geez, sorry, we just laid everybody off in that domain. You know, all our environmental specialists, where well, there's no big projects right now, so. So what are you going to do? I had a whole bunch of science credits, but I had worked as a camp counselor without any fatalities, <laughs> okay, for years. Working with, uh, you know, doing canoe, you know, bow and arrow, going up the mountain with the kids and doing nature stuff with them. So I said, well, maybe I could try teaching. I only had to do one extra year to become a teacher. I never, as a child, said to myself, I want to become a teacher. No, who in their right mind would think that right <laughs> off the bat, okay? But, well, some do, some do, especially the girls. I want to become a teacher. But for me, no, no way. But I did have some good science teachers, and they sort of inspired me. 
I said, yeah, I can do this. And I became a wacky science teacher. And you have to be, not to go nuts, you have to make things interesting for yourself too. So when my students come to the optics exam, <laughs> right before they get into the classroom, I say, put this on. And they have to put the whole suit as if they were real employees in an optics lab, you know, a clean room. Mask, uh, this year we ran out of gloves, because we didn't even have the gloves and ah. But they had to make a lens, a working lens. Well, not a real working lens, but at least a lens that followed some parameters with the light, that focused the light at a distance we required. And we use uh, gelatin to make the lenses. And they just carve them out with the curves of the lens. Uh, it, it works. And uh, I'm the only teacher who does that experiment anywhere. I don't, I just pop that in my mind, you know, hey, we should find a way to make lenses. And nobody else does that, at least not this way. I mean, the kids remember that one. And they sometimes aren't able to recognize themselves in the pictures, but at least they had fun. And, you know, I did Lego uh, robotics with my students, and we went to competitions. So always trying new stuff and all sorts of activities that take some of your time, but at least it got the kids excited. And sometimes, you know, have you heard that the last northern white rhino male just died? Okay? It's finished. That species is gonna go extinct because they only have females left. So, what are you gonna do? I've been using for almost 20 years a software and it's still good. Uh, you probably have heard of the game The Sims, where you, you know, have your alternate life in there, you know, control humans. Well, this is called Sim Safari, and it was made by the company that was bought by the bigger company that made The Sims. Electronic Arts made The Sims, and uh, well. When we got more computers in my classroom, because getting computers back then in the classroom was something, okay? Computers were expensive, so you had to be tenacious. My dream was to get the nicest classroom possible, computers for everybody. Whoa, the school board didn't see how that could become reality. But there was a program called Computers for School. Very nice people. They recycled computers from Bell, Hydro-Quebec, and all the big companies, and they gave them to school after a good cleanup, you know, formatting the drive, putting a basic windows in there. And I got 32 computers. Did, was the school board happy? No. No. They said, you do that. You fix them, you program them yourself. Okay. They didn't know I was handy with computers, so I did. And uh, using all sorts of activities like that, uh, I don't know, I think the videos, no, the videos don't show, uh, two television uh, stations came to my classroom to do reports and all the activities we did because nobody else does that. And at one point, interesting story, whoop, Sim Safari, we, we didn't have enough, you know, when you install, the kids don't understand the principle that if you install a software, you have to pay for it. They believe that you just download it. No, I can't. That's piracy. <laughs> so I had to get more licenses for Sim Safari, and it wasn't sold anywhere anymore. What are you going to do? I couldn't install it without telling anybody. So getting a live person at Electronic Arts was just an adventure in itself. <laughs> but I finally talked to a human being, and I said, Can I install Sim Safari on all my computers in the classroom? You know? And he said, what's Sim Safari? <laughs> I said, you made it. Oh, okay, we'll get back to you on that. And they did, and it says, we don't care. Install it, give it to all the students who want it at home. It's okay, we don't, we don't make any money. And in that old piece of software, you can play with animal populations. You can graph the population over time if you make a change. Uh, and if you don't hire workers from the neighboring town, and it's for real, if you don't hire the workers for your uh, safari, you know, for the, to drive the jeeps, to take care of the rooms and stuff like that, they'll start poaching. Mm. 
So it's very realistic. It, get them, it gets them to Africa without ever going there. So get, they get a, a feeling for it. And with that white rhino story, it's become too real. But I always stayed a kind of space maniac. And a lot of people around the world dreamt of being an astronaut. So what are you going to do if you're not really going to go to space? Well, a nice fellow, uh, Martin Schwiger in Britain, decided to make a space simulator just to brush up on his programming. And it sort of became its own creature. And hundreds of volunteer programmers all over the world have modeled, programmed every, every ship that has existed in for real or in the sci-fi movie, movies that you've seen or are planned by NASA and you can fly a mission to the ISS. And I'll tell you what, when you dim the lights and you do that by yourself and you follow all the procedure and it's not a PlayStation, it's, it's hard. You have to read and follow parameters, adjust your orbit. When you see that speck of an ISS appear in your screen, I got shivers. I was an astronaut at that time. So that, that was really cool. And it keeps evolving, so I use it with my students to do uh, space simulations. And, uh, well, I'm the only one who does that in Quebec. So I got, I got noticed, and you know that sequence in Apollo 13, when they have to undock, come back, and get that lunar module? They, they have to do it. That window is really small. You don't see a thing out of it. And very hard mission, but we do it. We have fun doing it. So like I said, uh, two TV stations came to see me. And then I got an award from the Amgen Corporation for my activities. So that gave some money to the school to buy more robots, money for me. So my, my teaching job became a lot more interesting just by you know, using what I learned as a kid during my studies and trying to always get to a next level, not staying just following the manual every year. That, that's, that's too boring for me. I can't, I can't stand that. So you can guess which one of the videos is older by the color of my hair. <laughs> okay. And you can see the old computers okay, in the back. Okay. The, the students didn't even have room for their books because of those things. Now we got flat screens okay, in the back, and now really nice. And since I got noticed for all my space activities, I, I was invited at a teacher conference at the Canadian Space Agency. And uh, they asked me to do a workshop on my activities with a whole bunch of uh, Canadian teachers. And uh, came up one time when they needed teachers to go to the Arctic with uh, some Canadian students. And they picked yours truly. And that was nice because I could never afford going there. Uh, on that trip, you can go to Europe three times for the cost of going to the Canadian, the Canadian Arctic. And it's a shame because it's, such, it's so impressive. Okay? I, I was just, you know, like you over there, you were the polar bear eating a walrus. And I was there with my camera, but in a boat, okay? not, not on the soil. Everywhere we went, we had people with guns around us. So that, that was nice. And over there, I met another nice teacher from British Columbia, Erica Van Ooyen. And uh, she told me, hey, uh, we talked about space and said, you know about the Honeywell uh, scholarship? No. Yeah, yeah, you could, you, you could get to the US space camp in Alabama for free. Honeywell pays for it. So I applied and I got there. I went there twice to the regular space camp and the advanced space camp. And, you know, it's like they say, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Sometimes it's important talking to people, sharing your projects, your activities. You never know when somebody's going to say, hey, did you know about, oh, yeah? And that was, that was fun. That's in Alabama, at the space camp. They make you do all sorts of stuff. But when I went back to advanced space camp, only 30 teachers per year go there from around the world. We went right up to the space shuttle Atlantis before lunch. I did not see the lunch. We had to leave before lunch. But we went in the hangars. And I could almost touch. I walked underneath space shuttle Discovery. But you could not touch. Big signs everywhere. No touch. But you know, 
those rocks, th this is all rocks, you know, small river rocks. Because when the, the crawler that brings the shell over there, it's so heavy that it'll crack the asphalt. Those, those are small quartz rocks, which is very hard. And some of them are broken in pieces. I, I wanted some. I said, no, you can't. Oh, geez, my shoelace is undone. I brought a couple in my socks. <laughs> I mean, geez, it's just rocks. There are millions of, of them over there. So, hey, hey, I just admitted a crime in the States. Come and get me. <laughs> but, I mean, those rocks were crushed just by that big crawler that's behind there and uh, brings the shuttle over there. So that was impressive, going to hangars where nobody goes, and that was a privilege. I never thought I'd get uh, doing that. And you do stuff, you do stuff, people notice, and then uh, I had a picture of me with uh, Stephen Harper because I, I won the uh, Canadian uh, Teacher Excellence Award for uh, space uh, topics, and uh, I got a plaque from Stephen Harper, and there's a pin in the plaque, you know, that you usually put on your clothes, but that pin is in the frame because it actually went on the last space shuttle flight, Atlantis. The Canadian Space Agency put that in there, went around the world, and I got it at home. And I hope my kids don't put it on eBay when I die. <laughs> I, I mean, I hope they oh, what's that junk, you know? <sighs> and I got some more money and you know my dream of becoming an astronomer well with that money that I, I want I built myself a backyard observatory you know you think observatory you think of a dome round okay now uh, that's all for show it's nice but all the astronomers I know and many working observatories you get a rectangle building and you just slide the whole roof off very easy to build and I have that in my backyard and I the school was able to buy a nice scope hooked to the computer and I sit there at night and my students can connect by the internet and control the telescope and take pictures with that scope. And again, I don't think anybody else does that, but it wasn't that hard. So my computer skills, my dream of becoming an astronomer and all that, it keeps going. I don't know where it's going to stop, all of these dreams, but it keeps me going. And uh, during the winter, astronomy in December, January, January, it's not that fun. Okay, you freeze in Quebec. So I wanted to do something else and go into uh, the elementary schools during the winter and do activities with the kids about space. And see, that's why uh, the internet, the new technologies and social media helps you so much to do things you never thought you'd be able to do because there's no way on earth I could have found that guy if he hadn't made a website. No way. Because that guy was not even 20 years old when he made that site. He made a program where you type in the dimension and it gives you the exact uh, way to cut out uh, plastic to make an inflatable planetarium. Because if you buy one, it's very expensive. But even gave me the, the plastic to buy. It's, uh, you know, and you see in the fields, the big white balls, it's hay with plastic over it. That's what I used. That bag is huge. The, the, the bag they get from the company, it's huge. Except that now you have to cut it. And uh, yeah, it's eight meters diameter. I can get 40 kids in there, but it took a while to cut every piece and a thousand feet of duct tape. That was long. <laughs> You're halfway through and he said, what, what was I thinking? Okay. I had no knees by the end of that project, but the kids just love it. You know, getting inside there, getting the feeling of a planetarium, because the Montreal planetarium is nice, but a lot of kids can't afford to go there. So I, at least I give them a little show and they liked it. And uh, we had some sponsors because sponsors love kids. So we were sponsored by uh, Bridgestone, who make tires. And actually, when I started astronomy, 
At what point did I start to become an, astro an astronomer again? It was when Canadian Tire had a sale of open box items and I found, wow, a four inch scope. I said, yeah, that's a nice scope. So I joined the astronomy club and uh, met with some of the astronomers one night and I never felt more stupid. First of all, I paid way too much for a scope that if I went to a good astronomy store, I would have gotten a bigger and better scope. What they sell in the big stores, is, it's not very good. And I was taught how to find galaxies in the sky from guys who were working at Bridgestone during the daytime. They were teaching me, a science teacher, about galaxies and they worked in the tire factory. So I got involved in the club and all sorts of people and everybody is very, becomes very knowledgeable because they share a lot and they go on the internet and they read. They never went to university but they, they become really good astronomers and experts on different astronomy topics so it's fascinating. We have doctors, electricians, all, all kinds of people in the club. So it's, it's fascinating to get that whole bunch of people together and decide to, to do even more uh, projects. Now, I was uh, president of the club for a few years and the last project I was able to do, we wanted an, observer, uh, an observation site with possibly an observatory. But where do you put an observatory? On top of a mountain as far away from the city from possible, but not too far away that people won't even come. Uh, it has to be high, it has to, you, have, you need a flat area. So Google Maps. I was on Google, Google Maps for hours and hours just you know, looking around all the northern area of Joliette in the area where we live. And then I see this, this mountain with the steep you know, cliff here and this nice flat area that's an old tennis court you know that's you know pretty rugged it's not used much anymore because the the surface is peeling off i mean you could hurt yourself so we went to auberge de la montagne coupe saint jean de mata and said well could we come here and with our telescopes and do astronomy and your clients could all come and look and everybody and uh, Marie Prefontaine, who was working there a few years ago, said, yeah, sure. And now the, I know the ownership has changed, and we were very happy that the, the new owner would, be, would like us to continue to do astronomy activities. So now we're very involved. And our first observatory, OK, it, it, it looks kind of strange, but it works just fine. It's an old camper, and nobody has ever done that. I, I was looking on the internet for a solution to do an observatory real quick, solid, with no budget, almost no budget. So we got, uh, whoops, we got a trailer camper that was abandoned at a camping. Everything was taken out, no furniture left in there. So we stripped it, cut the roof, made the sliding roof for it, and uh, we needed metal to do the roof. Well, some people get rid of their old swimming pools. That's a lot of metal for you. Cutting it was fun, but <laughs> we were able to do it. And inside, now, we got not one, but two telescopes hooked to the computers, big screen in the middle to show the sky maps, and people can sit down. And that, that's the fun part, because I'm actually the one doing the, the photography. But when somebody sits down, they say, okay, you click there, go there, go there. They feel like they're doing the photography. Because doing astronomy photography, it's really, sorry if it's me, I don't know. Uh, it's really, it's probably my girlfriend who's stressed out. I took her car, <laughs> a little beetle. Uh, looking in a telescope, everybody can do that and have fun. Doing photography, you have to be very good with computers and not throw something over your head when you get angry. Because you have, like on that scope here, we got two telescopes with two cameras. 
uh, a wheel with different filters in there, all sorts of stuff made from different companies that were never went, meant to work fine together. And Windows never helps. Okay? So sometimes we even use Windows XP because some of the stuff we use goes back to that time and it worked fine with XP. Now they, oh, upgrade. No, don't touch it. It works. So now people are able to take uh, amazing uh, pictures with our scope. That was uh, last summer's uh, partial eclipse. Uh, this is Andromeda Galaxy. That's a uh, nebula. Another galaxy and the moon is always fantastic. So for people to learn how to do photography, it's quite expensive and long. But I, get, I can get them to take their own galaxy picture in about 15 minutes with our setup. So the dream of being an astronomer, we try to make it available to everybody this way. But you, know, uh, you always meet people who help you improve. That's what networking is about. And social networking is great. That crazy guy here, Rock Lévesque, he's the one who took that picture of Jupiter, which is way better than pictures of Jupiters that you saw in your books when you were a kid, for sure. Okay, Mount Palomar could not do a good Jupiter picture like that uh, 30 years ago. And it's all thanks to the computer because actually that's not one picture. That's 3,000 pictures of Jupiter compiled by a computer, processed, treated with averages to make every detail come out. Because if you take one picture of Jupiter, all you see is a blob with some detail in parts of the picture, but not in the other. And Rock Lévesque does incredible pictures. He's a drummer and he works for DICOM delivering parcels during the day. So. Astronomy is something that, with technology, has become a dream that's accessible to everybody. Otherwise, it was painful to do. I did. Now, midlife crisis, you see that your body is starting to you know, rust a bit more than you wish. Diving was very dangerous when I was young, but now it's made to be very, very secure. Unless you have a heart attack, you'd have to be an idiot to die scuba diving or take chances that you never should have done. But when you respect your basic course, work as a team, dive with a friend, stay close, and even your equipment. I mean, if my main uh, respirator fails, I got a spare one. Cousteau, they had one. And with those big hoses, if the other guy needed air, he could not even share it with him. So now, oh, you need air, here you go. And we come back nicely up to the surface that way. So it's very safe. And I've got some of my high school kids, I got some funds to help them pay for their uh, scuba diving course. And uh, well, my girlfriend did not have much of a choice of <laughs> getting her scu scuba diving license to follow me everywhere. And uh, I've even had the students, uh, my whole, Classroom, grade 12, I, uh, I, knowing a diver that works at the Montreal Biodome, well, he says, you know, we have an isolation uh, pool where we put some fishes in there that we don't want to put with the rest. And those are uh, wolf fish. They, they look mean. They have like crooked teeth, but they're, <laughs> they're very gentle. And the whole classroom was able to go dive in there with the fishes. And they had rays and stuff. And oh, wow, I'm so excited. But then, you want to take a diving course? Well, I got a part-time job, and I don't have time. None. So that's why I'm, we're going to start them younger before they get that McDonald's, Tim Hortons job, and never have time to go scuba diving uh, for a long, long, long time. But uh, yeah, I realized that dream, and kept going, doing volunteer work, astronomy in the parks when the city has uh, fifth, fi oh yeah, festivities. Sorry. And again, another surprise, that's our uh, local MP. He brought me the Quebec National uh, Assembly Medal for the volunteer work. Another thing I hope won't go on eBay. But I mean, it's, it, it, you always get 
when you involve yourself, you will, you'll always get some appreciation from your city, from your neighbors, from the parents of the kids you help. It always, you know, helps. And my last, last slide, you know, you've seen my achievements, but she, that young girl here, is my biggest achievement. In the grade uh, eight, she never got below 98% in my exams. She finished in like 10 minutes when the others took 40. She was a genius. She is a genius. She's still alive, sorry. Uh, uh, her name is Melanie. And so I had her in grade 8. I was expecting her in grade 12 in physics and chemistry. But when she was in grade 10, and she was part of our astronomy club and liked it a lot, she said, hey, Monsieur Perrault, the, the University of Montreal, they have an online astronomy course now, and it's open to everybody. I think I'm going to take it. I said, well, well, you go ahead, girl. And then she comes back all sad. said, they won't let me register. I said, how come? She said, well, I'm not finished high school. They're accepting everybody, even people who never finished high school. Well, they say I'm too young. I said, I'll tell you what. If your dad pays for half the course with me, because I wanted to look at their material, you know, the online material that you have to be registered to see, I register under my name, you do the exams. I must say, I got a 93 average. <laughs> and the, the, the group average of adults was 88. She beat everybody. And uh, I emailed the, the teacher, Professor uh, Hernandez at University of Montreal about it. Say, hey, by the way, it's a grade 8 girl who got 93 in the last batch of students. He never replied. <laughs> probably missed that email in the whole bunch, but I'll probably meet him someday and joke uh, with him about that. So at the end of the year, at the school gala, we gave her an honorary, honorary certificate unofficial of being the first student from our school to complete a university course before ending her high school uh, degree. So when you, you see that you can fulfill your dreams, you have to encourage others to do the same and do what you can, when you can, to help them achieve them. Because, I mean, the, the happiness that you feel of succeeding at something that you dreamt about earlier as a kid, it, it's priceless. But now, like I say, with technology, I mean, she did the course by internet. She, not, she could not come to University of Montreal at that age. Would have been nice to see in the classroom, though, with all the adults. She would have, you know, she can learn a whole book, no problem. So I was very, very proud of that. And I'm waiting for the next Melanie or whoever and spot that kid that has a dream where I can help him achieve it. Because the others, well, sometimes they just don't know what their dreams are right now. So it's hard to see. But sometimes you do an activity and you see that, oh, wow, I really like that. I say, well, OK, well, maybe. You don't know where it can lead you. So well, that's, that's my little chat of the weird life I had and all the things that I never expected would happen to me just by you know, putting love and energy in the, what I did and sharing it, mostly sharing with people. If you keep everything to yourself, well, you reduce a lot of the potential that you have because the others can help you always go further with what uh, you want to do in life. So uh, that's it. Am I okay? Yeah.